Welcome back, AP. All right, so we are going to be picking off, pick it, picking off, picking up. There we go, picking up right now where we left off in class when we were talking about the effects of exploration, right? Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a longer flip, but that's going to be okay, right? We need to actually go over some really, really key important concepts that the era of exploration is going to leave behind leading into the period that you would refer to as the Reformation. Actually, ironically enough, we're kind of again fast forwarding. We're going all the way up until about the 1600s and then we're jumping backwards again and da 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 da. So anyway, big thing that we left off on in class, we were talking about, of course, the Columbian Exchange, right? Oh, by the way, just a quick heads up, your next class, we're going to be having a stimulus based multiple choice quiz. We're going to be taking a quiz um, of about, you know, nine or ten of the stimulus pack multiple choice questions just to get you practicing, just to get you used to them so you can become more comfortable and more confident with them, okay? So I just wanted to give you a heads up that those are coming, so make sure you study this stuff um, going forward so you know that, like, the effects of expiration and the early reformation are going to be tested on that quiz. Uh, it's not going to be that bad, but I just need you to practice doing those as much as possible because, as we know, like we said, Hardest part about taking an AP test is, of course, the multiple choice for history because you're never really quite sure. But I'm going to train you on how to become more sure, right? So just make sure you study a little bit, but you'll be fine, okay? Now, we left off talking about the Columbian Exchange, right? The Columbian Exchange, of course, being that massive exchange of products going from the Eastern Hemisphere, including things like horses, cattle, chickens, pork, uh, certain crops like bananas, citrus fruit, apples, coffee things like that being transported over to the Western Hemisphere in exchange, quote-unquote, for goods like cocoa, pumpkins, tomatoes, turkeys, squash, corn, and all these other crops, right? Uh, now, of course, another Eastern Hemisphere good being wheat, which was very important. Now, really quick under thing, understandable thing to also understand, the, oh, wow, under, I said understand just now, like four times. Big thing to understand, the Colombian exchange was not intentional. It's not like anybody sat down and said, well, we have these things, and they have these, those things, and we're going to bring our disease, right? Because that was never really intentional. The Columbian Exchange was a process that happened over time, much like something the Columbian Exchange caused, right? The Columbian Exchange is also going to cause this thing known as the Commercial Revolution, right? The Columbian Exchange was not intentional. It's just something that occurred. Just like the commercial revolution was not intentional, it's just something that occurred. And what the commercial revolution was towards the latter end of exploration was the dramatic increase in trade and trade goods, right? Particularly Colombian exchange goods, these things that were not available to consumers on either side of the planet, which is going to result in a massive boom in economic growth of Europe, right? This is going to be one of the key facets and the key factors that's going to cause that technological acceleration of the European people, right? A lot of historians sit down and they argue, like, why is it that the East began to stagnate and the West began to leap forward in technology and became one of the dominant ruling powers? Well, this is a big reason why right? A big reason why, one of the many reasons why this occurred, it does relate back to the commercial revolution and the fact that the economic growth in Europe was so massive following the discovery of North and South America. Discovery. Other people discovered it already. They're called Native Americans. But it is important to understand that their understanding of the products that were available there and the fact that Europeans didn't have access to them was going to drive the cost of those products up, right? Something we'll get into later, but just kind of write it down as an example. Tulip mania, right? T-U-L-I-P mania, as in the flower, which apparently at one point in, in Europe, especially in the Netherlands, tulips were selling for somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 in the right average everyday money for a bulb, per bulb of tulips, right? It's why Holland to this day is covered in them, right? Now, but it's a big reason why is because the Dutch had no idea what a tulip was. They discovered them in the new the new world, quote unquote. Uh, Excuse me. They're going to start bringing them over. And people are going to be willing to pay a lot of money for products they've never seen, right? The Italians are going to have access to tomatoes. The Irish are going to gain access. Well, not the Irish. That's messed up. The crop of the poor is going to become the potato, right? The commercial revolution is wildly important because it's just bringing cash money to Europe, right? Very, very important. But we got to understand also why that happened, how it happened. How a thing that was never really intentional actually occurred, right? 
And a big product of it is because when wherever we're discussing the Colombian exchange, you have to know that the Colombian exchange is going to lead to increased trade, right? So you can write the Colombian exchange led to increased trade over the water if you want that or over the land as well, right? But the increase in trade due to the Colombian exchange is going to be massively important. And it's going to cause three key things. It's going to cause more work. Oh, wow. I don't like the way I phrased that sentence. It's going to cause three key things. It's going to cause a higher need for workers and labor. It's going to create more cash for banking and lending. And it's also going to grow and expand merchant wealth, right? And merchant power is going to expand along with it, right? Because as we know, technology is driven by finances and economy. Power is driven by the same exact force, right? Now let's talk about really quick why increased trade from the Colombian exchange is going to lead to a more of a high need for labor, right? Well, the reason why is because the feudal system is losing its efficiency, right? Because during the Middle Ages, the feudal system was the key demographic, economic, governmental facet that kept Europe running, right? This idea that nobles own land, okay, and the nobility and their landowning stock had, can provide a service, if you will, to a serf, right? The serf will provide their labor. The service provided from the Lord is protection from outsiders in what a Roman would refer to as a barbarian, even though the feudal system, well, the feudal system has its roots and don't, don't get confused, all right? I'm not going to try and confuse you right now. The feudalism is, just, feudalism is just losing its efficiency, right? Due to the fact that this subsistence-based economy, in a nutshell, is just not functional anymore, right? Because when serfs are now realizing that the commercial revolution is occurring, feudal serfs, when they are free of their contracts of which they are bound to the land by, they now begin to move to towns where they will be paid for their labor instead of just receiving quote-unquote protection or having to be bound to the land by a contract. The commercial revolution provides a better life for serfs, and it also limits the power of nobles. This makes kings very, very happy, right? And also the commercial revolution requires to make more money, more workers. They need workers to process goods that are coming from North and South America. They need workers to man these ships and actually work on them. They need workers to go and colonize these areas. They need all kinds of different stuff. But the, the feudalism, feudal system was losing efficiency, which is providing labor that the commercial revolution needs, right? So also, because of the commercial revolution, a big effect of it is more cash is becoming available, right? With the commercial revolution, we now have products. With these new products, they have to be paid for. When people begin to buy these products, more cash is now circulating through the economies, right? Now that more money is available to commoners, a small middle class that's popping up, more money is going to be available for building a business, right? Now that the Medici's are making more money and seeing savings increase, now you're going to see them lending more money out to other former guild workers or merchant guild workers that are going to lend or borrow this money to start another business, right? To start a business. That's going to be very important. So the commercial revolution ends up leading to economic efficability throughout the areas of Europe. You're talking about more money being available because of the commercial revolution for businesses to build themselves. Bang, increased economy, right? Then you're also talking about merchant wealth and power is expanding, right? This is why it's referred to as the commercial revolution, right? Since merchant wealth is growing and they're making more money and their power is expanding and they're making more like powerful gains, you're also going to see one particular group reap the benefits of this commercial revolution. And that happens to be the monarchs, right? The monarchs control taxation. And since merchants are not a part of the feudal system, none of their labor nor funds goes to nobility. Instead, the taxes go directly to the monarchs. And if the merchants are making more money, then the monarchs can take more in taxes. And it's just like when we were talking about Marie Rolly, right? When Marie Rolly brought up the tithe increasing in Renaissance Italy because of the economic increase, the church is making more money. The monarchs are going to make more money because of exploration because of the commercial revolution because they tax the merchants directly, right? So now that the merchants are making more money, the monarchs are making more money, right? And when we look at it, it's kind of a little bit like this when we get into it. But just so you know that this commercial revolution plants the seeds of this mercantilism, right? The idea that countries are going to try and grow gold and silver and foodstuffs and raw materials in massive amounts 
to keep competing now, not only with the people within their country, but with the countries outside of them as well, okay? So you just need to know, or you can jot down really quick, the seeds of mercantilism are like placed. Mercantilism, mercantilism. But we will bring that up in the next unit. It's not that important now, but it is important to know that mercantilism is a process that's showing up post-exploration and along with this commercial revolution, right? So remember, commercial revolution, the trade going back and forth with these Colombian exchange goods is creating massive economic growth throughout Europe. You now see more people working for it, like working, making money with their labor instead of working on a feudal site. You now see people that are working and making money, borrowing money from banks because there's more cash available for money lending. And you're also seeing merchant power grow. But as merchant power grows, you're going to see the government and the monarchy's power grow through taxation, right? So very important that we understand this whole commercial revolution process and what it's leading to, right? Now, the other major effects of the commercial revolution are going to include things like this revolution coupled with this commercial revolution coupled with the Colombian exchange begins to create a consumer based economy all right so don't write this down word for word write it in shorthand nobody wants you to write this stuff down word for word it's going to suck the energy of your learning right through your pen onto your paper and you're not going to remember this stuff right now write it down in shorthand what i'm saying is the commercial revolution with Colombian exchange products is going to lead to a consumer-based economy, right? In the Middle Ages, during the feudal system, it was more of what I refer to as what the future Caleb Terry PhD will refer to as a subsistence-based economy, right? Subsistence style in the needs of nobles need serf for labor, serf needs nobles for safety. That's that subsistence base. They're not really gaining tons of power. The nobles would gain money and then, of course, reinvest it into their like fields and farming and their land, which is like a primitive form of capitalism. Uh, very primitive because they didn't necessarily have any kind of tangible gains out of that money being made because it, again, is more of a subsistence-based economy. But the commercial revolution creates a consumer economy where you now have merchants and guilds and regular people and this growing small teeny tiny little middle class and even the peasant class having the ability to make money and buy goods with it, right? So that is huge and very important to understand. We will talk later on about the growth of this thing called the Industrious Revolution and how people begin to work hourly for labor later on due to this whole consumer revolution and commercial revolution and all these other revolutions that we'll talk about. Now, another big thing about the commercial revolution, though, is the African slave trade is going to boom after this, following the massive amount of death and die-off of the natives that live in North and South America due to the encomienda system, right? And the encomienda system is very important that we remember is native work or else, because I'm giving you some Jesus, right? Like, so some really messed up system, and they're going to die off due to disease and the encomienda system of overworking. And so the African slave trade is going to be needed to supplant that death and die off of, of the natives in the Americas, right? So African slavery is going to skyrocket, originally started by, again, who? Good job, Malaya, that's exactly right. The Portuguese are the ones that actually turned the uh, slavery base from Black Sea Eastern Europeans, also aka Slavs, the origin of the word slave, and is going to turn it more towards an African base, right? One of the worst things that has ever happened in all of history. Hi, beautiful wife, oh, how are you? You want to say hey to the AP girls real quick? I don't think they've ever seen you before. They didn't? I didn't meet them yet? No, yeah, I don't. Wait, no, yeah, you put the party hat on my head. That's right, yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. I don't think so they've ever met Rufio well, before. Okay. He's, like, he's not a street. Not Come here, baby. Rufio. He's a sweetheart. Oh, well, he's a big baby. And he's the favorite child in our house. He's the beautiful, beautiful little hound dog baby. Oh, I wrote no, you too. I wrote, no, she's not. Favorite. No, he loves no. Oh, no. Okay, no. He is the sweetness. He is the oh, look at the yeah, face. Oh, look at oh, look at the no. We don't need the no. Like, no we don't need this in here. We don't. Ne oh. What the? Uh -uh, no, you can get her out of here. <laughs> like, so you are not gonna mush my baby's face like that. The be, the hound dog is the cute one. We're talking about the commercial revolution and like a growth of African slave trade following the encomienda system. You know what the encomienda system is. What are you talking about last week? Kind of no, it's this whole thing. Like so, it's this whole thing where like the the natives had to work so they could get Jesus from the colonizers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that works. Yeah, you know, that's and they were only supposed to work a small amount of time. But how often do you think that the Spanish made the natives work? Yeah, all the time. All the time. And then disease is going to kill them off. And then also another important effect of this entire thing is this Colombian that... exchange as well. Yeah. See. Yeah. So like, and then, but another important effect. Messy, is... messy system. I'm ready. I love you too. I gotta keep going. Okay. Enjoy this. All right. So anyway, now. 
So, other big important effect that's going to occur, though, is that craft guilds are going to start losing a lot of their power and their grip to merchant guilds, right? So, you're going to see a die-off of craft gilding, and you're going to see a lot of their stuff going down the tubes. And we'll talk about this later on when we talk about the death of urban guilds and how that's going to eventually be supplanted by mass markets in the Industrial Revolution later on. But again, these are all important concepts that transcend units. You cannot sit there and be like, oh, um... So is this the only time this is going to happen? No, this commercial revolution is going to transcend several units. So you need to make sure you market. It's going to become a very important concept. And the effects of the commercial revolution are going to be super important that we're going to talk about a little bit later on as well. Now, the other big thing about the effects of the commercial revolution is you're going to see the rise of these things that I call the companies, right? But what we're going to refer to this as is we're going to see a state-nation-based economic system start popping up, right? Now, what I mean by that, jot that down, state and nation-based economics, right? Instead of nobles who control a certain amount of land within a quote-unquote kingdom, right, uh, it's now going to start moving to the monarchs are going to begin to sponsor and delegate and charter economic gains to certain people, right? Now, this is an important thing to understand. So the monarchs, now that their power is growing from the commercial revolution, and it's growing during the Renaissance, and it's growing through direct action like the Spanish Inquis Inquisition and the Reconquista uh, from Isabella and Ferdinand, right? We're going to talk about their grandson, actually, in the next unit, um, Charles V. Uh, like, we are going to, we have to understand that the monarch power is growing. And now that their power is growing, they want to see it keep growing. And in the following unit after this, we're going to talk about absolutism. And the era of absolutism is the peak of all of like absolute power in Europe, right? Now the companies though, they're gonna start popping up is due to the fact that you gotta understand whenever we're last hearing of the Eastern side, right? The reason why we're getting into this is we're talking about how is all the commercial revolution going to affect the Eastern side of the planet? We've been talking heavily about the encomienda and all these other systems and how it affects the natives in North and South America, the former Aztecs, the former Inca, the former Taino people that Columbus actually came into direct contact with again. Say that with me again, Taino, right? A lot of us forgot to talk about them again as well, but they 90% of them end up dead or actually being culturally assimilated into the Spanish economy due to uh, disease and die off. But we never even like really came back. The last we heard of Portugal, was that they were in India, right? That they went around Africa with Vasco da Gama and Bartholomew Diaz and the Cape of Storms, and they went around Africa, found the spice trade conduits to India, and began to bring spice, spices back to Europe, right? And the other only people that we really listened to being nearby were the Dutch. And the Dutch were actually located in the Spice slash Java slash Malacus Islands, right? And they were making their money independently there, right? So just so you understand, the Dutch were trying to make their money in the Malacus Islands based off of a couple of things, right? Based off coffee growing, which was a very big business in that place that grows really well, and also based off these little guys called civets cats, right? Dutch traders would capture these animals known as civets cats, um, and civets cats are well known in Java amongst the locals of the Java Islands that they would eat coffee and that the acid inside of a stomach of a, like, of a civets cat uh, would actually process and cure the coffee, and then the cats would, like, poop the coffee out, and people from Java actually make coffee out of that civet's cat coffee poop. Uh, it's very, very popular there, and apparently it's some of the world's best coffee. It actually comes from the, goes through a civet's cat. But the Dutch didn't use it for that. The Dutch didn't use the civet's cat for that. They actually killed the civet's cats and then harvested its glands out of its I'm just going to say, like, harvested, harvested its anal glands and then actually made perfumes out of it and began to sell that back in Europe, right? So Dutch is finding a foothold in spice trading, civets cats perfume, and also some spices coming out of the Malacca's Islands, and the Portuguese are in India reaping the spice trade, right? But you see, here's the interesting facet about India. India was ripe for the picking by anybody and everybody, right? So the thing about India is, oh, whoop, whoop, whoop. so when we left off, there we go, when we left off in the east, right, the Portuguese are in India in the spice trade, the Dutch are in the spice job islands trying to kill civets cats, which is really messed up. Um, uh, but the thing about India is everybody's got eyes on India, right? The Portuguese have certain controlling stakes, right? They own a few port towns on this side outside of Calicut, and the big thing about it is they decide that they are going to tell the Indian people 
oh, we'll protect you from any other Europeans who plan on coming in to try and take these port towns away from you. And the, so the Indian princes agree. But wait a second, what did I just say? The Indian princes, right? The thing about India is that India was a heavily divided area, much like Renaissance Italy being divided into independent nation states in the northern area. India was not a fluid country controlled by one empire. At certain points in history, it was like the Mughal Empire was a very, very large one. Um, the empire led by Ashoka the Great was a very, very large one. Uh, the adoption of some Muslim territories and Muslim empires in the north. The Persians are going to actually show up in India at one point, but it's going to lead to an India that is highly fractured, and it's going to have different provinces, and each province is going to be led by what is known as a Raj, right? A Raj or an Indian prince, R-A-J, right? Every single province was led by a Raj, and if you ruled over several of these provinces, you were known as a Great Raj or a Maharaja, right? So... And Raja is also the name of the tiger in Aladdin, yes. Where would we be without my wife connecting European history to Disney movies? You're never going to forget that. You're never going to forget that. And that's me, not you. Yeah. You see what you're doing? Do you you see what y'all are doing to my marriage? Do you see what you're doing in marriage? Where would you be? Probably wouldn't be remembering those so anyway, the Maharajas are going to lead over these provinces, right? The Rajas. And the thing about it is a lot of the Europeans decide that they're going to be like Patrick Starr right here, and they're going to start scheming, right? Because the India that is in, or excuse me, the Portuguese only control one southern province of India, right? But look at all these other provinces within India that are open for taking and seduction by other people, right? Now, the thing about it is there is some little incontinuities here, right? Because the feud over these provinces in India are going to lead to the establishment of sovereign trade companies, right? So what I mean by sovereign is the idea that they do not function under a government, right? So you have to understand that if England were to go out and just be like, oh, we're going to go take some of these port towns from Portugal, That's going to lead to an all-out war, right? That's going to lead to a huge war that the English are not ready to fight, and neither is the Dutch, and the Dutch are just becoming a country. Like, we're going to talk about this in a later unit, but the Dutch end up going through this whole big thing called the Dutch Golden Age, right? And then then this Dutch Golden Age, they end up actually having this huge promise of, oh, we're going to be fun, blah, 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 blah. Like, so, but the thing about it is, you can't just go directly fight Portugal, or else it's going to lead to an all-out war, right? So instead, they establish these things called the East India Companies, and they do this to become like a sovereign trade organization. You can't go to war with the East India Company because it's just a what? It's just a company, and the companies all have logos, and every single country starts making their company made up of former nobles and wealthy merchant class owners that would all create these companies known as joint stock companies, right? They would create these companies where they would be like, oh, well, I own a boat, right? And I can't just take, if I try to go trade with Portugal with this one boat, that one boat might sink and I could lose my entire investment. But instead, they would group all these boats together from several different other nobles and create these for there to be like, oh, we don't count. We're technically not sanctioned by a country. But the charters for these companies were given to them by the monarchs, right? It's absolutely hypocritical. And all they're going to do is keep going over to these provinces in India and keep convincing these Rajas that, oh, if you side with us, the Dutch East India Company will protect you from the English East India Company, but then they're going to slowly start infiltrating their way into Indian society, where in the 1800s, India is going to be completely taken over by the English, right? Like, so it's absolutely ridiculous. So they preyed upon the fractured identity of India. Sorry, I get very worked up about this. But as you can see, look at all these different, like, settlements. These port towns and European settlements all have individual flags next to them. Look, British, or British, Portuguese, French, Dutch, the Danes are even going to become heavily involved. And when I say heavily, they had like two or three port towns. They were the smallest ones, um, but they were still there. So, but the big thing about it is they're going to start competing over all these different territories. And this is going to lead to some armed conflict between Europeans later on, right? The British and the Dutch East India companies are going to begin to race, an all-out race for India, using their we're not technically with our government quota thing, which is so dumb and not true. But look, if you want to avoid a war, it's what you got to do. And the Dutch are going to establish a strategic key point in the settlement known as Cape Town, South Africa, to officially 
cut the Portuguese off and sever their trade lines and force them to start trying to find other routes to India, which was absolutely ingenious and super messed up. And by the and by the Br bah, that this, this sentence doesn't even make sense. But the British and the Dutch begin a trend, right? And then this takes over of other Asian states, and the Europeans begin to dominate Southeast Asia by the mid-1650s, right? So by the end of time period one, up until 1648, Southeast Asia in general is literally just being scrambled over by every European state and their company, quote-unquote, that apparently is not tied to them, which is absolute trash garbage and not true whatsoever. And they end up literally taking this uh, all of these East Asian countries and infiltrating their way into the societies. And this is another reason why the East India or the East Asian societies begin to kind of slow or plateau in their technological development. A lot of it does to do with European meddling, right? And the fact that they wanted them to stay more primitive to them so they could exert their control, right? Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving into our next unit. And in our next unit, we're going to be talking about the Reformation and the religious wars that are going to result throughout Europe. So we just finished, right, the exploration unit. I'm going to fix your study cover over this weekend, and I'm going to submit that on Google Classroom uh, by Tuesday, right, when we come back to school. And it's going to be the completely new updated version, so you'll be ready and have that to cover up your notes and to exist as like a little study guide. So... All right, sorry about that. I had to step away for like two seconds to just get kind of like a little time check, right? Don't want to ruin your entire Labor Day weekend. You got it right that time. Uh, and actually like suck up all the time in general, right? But we just finished up the exploration unit, right? We just finished up talking about like the age of discovery in Europe. Now we're rewinding all the way back again to the Middle Ages pretty much to get into the Reformations. Notice I said reformations. Yeah, because there's like three different types of the reformation that's going on during this time period. There's a counter-reformation, there's a Lutheran reformation, there's a Calvinist reformation. And we're also going to get into the religious wars that it caused, right? So going forward, though, we have to understand the state of like religion and the church in the 16th century. And if you want to just kind of write an overarching theme for this entire unit, basically we're talking about the growth of religious pluralism in Europe. And what I mean by that in a sense is you're going to see multiple churches. Instead of one uniform church known as the Catholic Church, you're going to see multiple new churches popping up, right? So religious unity out the window after the Reformation, and you're going to see the growth of faiths of what you would refer to as Protestant, right? I was raised as a Protestant. Yay, yay! I'm trying to turn the volume down on him. Did this, did this work? Did this button work? I'm going. Is he yelling in your house, too? <laughs> <laughs> all right, anyway, now, this is why they like you more than me, because all you do is make fun of me. She's mean. Um, so, also, the candy that I'm bringing y'all, you don't get any until you tell me that you think that I'm cooler than my wife is. All right, so, anyway, now, just so you know, though, the Protestant faiths are going to pop up. You're going to see the growth of, like, uh, religious pluralism, like we just said. But before we get there, before we get to the end goal, we got to kind of understand... What's the state of the church in the 16th century? Now, remember, 16th century means the 1500s. So we're talking about prime time high renaissance era right now, right? The Again, our marker for the high renaissance is the finishing of the Sistine Chapel around 1508 or 1510. So you're looking at a very important key time, right? Literally, when... Martin Luther came to Rome and was apparently disgusted by the state of the city because he said it was a city of foxes and beggars. Uh, he literally was there while Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling, right? But before we go any further, you got to understand that the populace of Europe was still very deeply pious, right? It's not like the Reformation grew out of a state of non-pious belief system structures in Europe. Everyone went to church every Sunday, and you also went to church multiple times a week. You not only did that, you went to confession multiple times a week, and I believe, I could be wrong, but I think you actually went to church every day. I think it was like morning mass every day, and then of course a large Sunday mass every single week. And there were these, all these intense like views of women and villages, and how that affected the Catholic church dynamic structure within each city, but the thing you are going to see is pop up is regardless of this deep piousness, you're going to see criticisms about the church in the fifth, in the 16th century start popping up, right? Particularly about the wealth, the wealth and the excess of the church in general, right? So 
the events of the Middle Ages are going to drastically damage the reputation of the church, right? And if, like, I don't know, oh yeah, I didn't remember why. The events of the Middle Ages are going to drastically damage the reputation of the church and lead to even more criticism. And then the Renaissance didn't help even a little bit because you're going to see the growth of some reform-minded movement artists and writers that are going to start criticizing the church as well. Our Erasmuses, our St. Thomas Moores, our Utopias, our Praise of Follies are going to begin to pop up and they're going to begin to poke fun and make fun of the church. Now, the reason why we talk about St. Thomas More and Erasmus in the Renaissance and not in the Reformation is it's very key and very important that you understand that Erasmus and St. Thomas More never stopped being Catholic. Our reform-minded and reformist movement people actually did stop being Catholic and became other types of Christian. So Erasmus and more stayed catholic until the day they died more in particular when he lost his noggin after he told henry that he should have never left catherine of aragorn and anne boleyn was like a Bleh. and then henry felt some type of way and had saint thomas more executed so yeah he ended up about like seven or eight inches shorter right so now this right here of course right the renaissance didn't help this is the virgin on the rocks right this is the uh, the inspiration for mona lisa hmm, for any of y'all that remember that the flip that i made now how I, really good question though too the Reformation didn't just all of a sudden go, like, right? The Reformation had started long before the 15, the 1500s, the 16th century, right? Long before. Because the big thing about it is eggs had been laid. I know that somebody's like, eggs? I don't want to talk about a bunch of old white dudes from Europe laying eggs, right? I know that the seeds of the idea of the Reformation would probably be a better uh, metaphor here. But eggs is funny, considering the clip art that I found. All right, so now, really quick, though. The eggs of the Reformation had been laid long before the Reformation itself ever actually started. One big part of it is, like, this whole list, very important, right? Now, some of them you don't know, and we're going to end up talking a little bit about right now. But it's really, really important that you do understand that the conciliar movement is a major, major, major movement that came pre-Reformation, right? Now, what the conciliar movement was, was this idea that began to pop up inside of Europe during the late 1300s, right? The conciliar movement was the idea that the Pope should not be the leader of the Catholic Church, that it should actually be a council of cardinals rather than one singular Pope, right? Now, this movement began to gain steam, and we'll talk about early reformers and their ideas about this conciliar movement here in a second, right? Now, but anyway, the conciliar movement does become a very, very prominent theme of the Middle Ages we'll talk about later. You also saw the eggs laid by Erasmus, right? The praise of folly that was calling out warrior popes and these popes that viewed themselves as more king-like and less of the patriarch of the church, right? Also, Erasmus is actually volunteering ideas of vernacularly-based Bibles, right? Having the Bible actually first translated into Greek. Now, you're also going to see Sir Thomas More actually creating his fictional utopia based on true Catholic values instead of being based on wealth. That's why, of course, the chains and the toilets are made of gold because he said that's about as worthwhile that they are when compared to your faith, right? He also said that, or, oh, excuse me, not he also. You also saw the Great Western Schism, which was massively important, right? The Great Western Schism was when there were multiple popes throughout all of Europe. You had the popes of Avignon in France. You had the pope in Rome. You also then even had a pope in Germany. And at one point, there were four different popes, right? Pope, actually elected by the cardinals, was known as the pope. And then the other ones were called the anti-popes, right? And actually, people began to draw political and warlike ties based on which pope fit their political demographics, right? So that Great Western Schism is a big one as well. The donation of Constantine, finding out that that is actually not a real, real document whatsoever by Lorenzo Valla, the early humanist writer. He was like, oh, this letter from Constantine definitely was written after he was already dead. He didn't write it, and giving all ruling authority to the Catholic Church would be absolutely ridiculous, and Constantine wouldn't believe it in the first place, all right? You also had warrior popes like Julius II. The lives of popes in general were actually these lays, these eggs laid by the, uh, Reforma by the Middle Ages that were growing discontent within the Catholic faith. And why am I calling them eggs? Because the big thing about it is these eggs are going to hatch into full-blown Reformation ideas, of course, by your boy Martin Luther. But the thing about it that's important to understand is he is just the chicken that sat on the eggs that happened to get them to hatch. Any warm body would have done, right? The Reformation was going to happen regardless of Luther, right? Luther and others, they just kind of hatched them. They just brought them to life. 
and the snowball that would become the Reformation began to roll following events like these from the Middle Ages and began to pick up steam and turned into a full-blown movement that crushed religious mono, mo, the religious monolith that was European Catholicism that came before the Reformation, right? Now, going forward, though, the earlier reformers there also were as well. There are Reformation people, Reformation figures, Reformation like ideas that came before Martin Luther ever even existed, before he was born, hundreds of years before he was born. One big one was Mar Mar it's actually Marsilius or Marsiglio de Padua. Um, he was the first one to coin the idea of the conciliar movement. He was the very first one to come up with the idea that the church is not ever wrong, right? He, well, no, he didn't come up with the idea. He protested the idea that the church could be wrong and said that, you know, it's a faith. It's not necessarily led by a pure human being. And so that's why he said a council of cardinals should be the ultimate power in the church rather than a singular pope. And that that council of cardinals should call out the pope if he is performing ill or if he is doing wrong. So under the ideas of Marsiglio de Padua, Julius II would have been ousted out of his office a long time ago, right? And then you saw other people like John Wycliffe show up, who was an English reformer long before, long, long before anybody even heard of Martin Luther. Because in the 1300s, John Wycliffe began to obstinately stand against any wealth of the church whatsoever. He used to say, look, the Benedictine rules say that we are supposed to take vows of poverty. This is not about to be not supposed to be about financial gain. This is supposed to be about preaching a faith, right? And he himself was a priest. He stood against monasticism as well. He was like, these sects of monks are more about their ideas and their faith rather than being about the faith itself, right? So John Wycliffe protested any wealth-based ideas of the of the Catholic Church whatsoever. And then you saw the main figure, the big chief daddy early reformer himself, Jan Hus, right? Jan Hus was a bohemian Czech, right? C-Z-E-C-H, right? He's a Czech philosopher. Um, well, the, the area at the time was referred to as Bohemia, right? And as a Czech philosopher, he's actually the very first successful reformer as well. He actually created the very first Bible to be written in a different language. It was written completely in Czech, and he actually created a new church, and his followers were called the Hussites. And his big thing against it was he spoke out against the immorality of the popes and the immorality of the leadership within the Catholic Church. And so he technically, technically is the very first reformer. You could say that the Reformation started with Jan Hus before it ever started with Martin Luther because he created the first prominent Protestant or the first Protestant faith, the Hussites, right? And so some of you are like, are Hussites still around? Uh, ironically enough, no. They were so good at hiding that they all died. All right, so like they were so good at hiding their beliefs and keeping secretive from the Catholic Church that they all ended up dying out. We found some Czech Bibles that relate back to the Hussites, but no Hussite people really remain. And the reason why they were so good at hiding is because their leader, Jan Hus, was called to a very important meeting called the Council of Constance, right? And at the Council of Constance, they declared John Wycliffe, the English reformer that came before him, a heretic and that all of his remains be dug up and then thrown out of any cemetery that was Catholic. And they also declared Jan Hus a heretic as well. And at this council, they were told him specifically before he got there, you will be safe, you will be fine, we want to talk to you about your ideas. They totally double-crossed him and then put him in front of an inquisition, declared him a heretic, and then burned him at the stake, right? And since his followers then found out that he was burned at the stake by the Catholic Church and the Pope at the time, I believe, it wasn't Pope, uh, it wasn't Pope John the 22nd. I'll have to look up the Pope that actually did it. I think it might have been Alexander the 6th. It's not Sixtus, though. Ah, we'll look it up. He's definitely a, like a part of the schism, though. There were multiple popes at the time. But they called him to the Council of Constance, promised they wouldn't hurt him, and then burned him at the stake for his crimes against the Catholic Church, right? So there were reformers that came long before people like Luther ever existed, right? And we will pick up on these ideas and how the church even violated rules that they came up with later on in class. I will talk to y'all soon. Have a great weekend. Remember, you're going to have a quiz soon. Study your stuff. I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one.